I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime, and this is Currents. Bishop DiMarzio takes on the times. We'll tell you what he had to say. That our Pope, our church, our bishops, our priests can no longer be the personal punching bag of the New York Times. A sea of green washes over the streets of Bay Ridge. St. Patrick's brought the faith to the people of Ireland, and the people of Ireland brought the faith to this country, and they built our churches with all their traditions. And all the churches in Brooklyn and Queens were open Monday night. We'll find out what was going on inside. Well, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, during a week that Catholics consider the holiest time of the year, it's also a time of crisis for the Catholic Church after revelations over the last few weeks and months of abuse at Catholic institutions in Ireland and Germany that extend back for decades. Many are now accusing the media of a smear campaign against Pope Benedict following reports in the New York Times that tried to connect the Pope to the case of a Milwaukee priest who allegedly abused up to 200 deaf students dating back to the 1950s. Well, last night at St. James Cathedral, Brooklyn's own Bishop DiMarzio spoke about all of this during the diocese's annual Chrism Mass. The Chrism Mass draws hundreds of priests, deacons, and laity every year. At this Mass, priests and deacons renew their promises before the bishop, and the bishop blesses the oils and sacred chrism that will be used throughout the diocese. But last night, that annual ritual was overshadowed by Bishop DiMarzio's homily. The bishop took aim at the New York Times for its recent coverage of the church sex abuse scandals, and he did not mince words. I want to take a moment to speak about the New York Times mischaracterization of the role of the Holy Father when he was Archbishop in Munich and also when he was Prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. The fact is that the paper has admitted significant facts with respect to the, certain, the case of the priest in Wisconsin. The reality is that the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith did not have competency over the canonical trials in 1996 when the case is first believed to have been referred to the congregation under the direction of Cardinal Ratzinger at that time. Moreover, the priest in question, a certain Father Murphy, was in the midst of a canonical trial. He died before a verdict was rendered. Also, the case of the priest in Munich Archdiocese also is presented as a definite error of judgment when all the facts are not known. This evening, I ask you to join me in making your displeasure known to the editors of the New York Times. I might even suggest canceling our subscriptions to the New York Times, but we need to know what the enemy is saying. Enough is enough, however. Two weeks of articles about a story that happened decades ago in the midst of the most holy season of the church is both callous and smacks of calumny. I ask you to stand up with me and send the message loud and clear that our Pope, our church, our bishops, our priests can no longer be the personal punching bag of the New York Times. Strong words there from Bishop DiMarzio. And coming up later, we'll have a Currents exclusive. I'll speak with Father Thomas Brundage. He's the priest who actually oversaw the case of Father Murphy in Wisconsin that the bishop just referred to there. He's also been sharply critical of the New York Times as well, and he'll explain exactly why. Well, stay with us. There's much more Currents straight ahead. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Coming up in a bit, a time of reconciliation for area parishioners during this Holy Week. We'll take you there. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. 
Amid a growing sex abuse scandal in Europe and questions over how abusive priests have been handled in some American dioceses, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops is defending the Pope's actions regarding clerical sex abuse. In a statement released yesterday, the U.S. bishops say they know from experience that Pope Benedict is deeply concerned for those who have been harmed by sexual abuse and he has strengthened the church's response to victims. The bishops also praise the Pope for his support of their efforts to deal with abusive priests. Meantime, there are more accusations of physical abuse by clergy in Germany. Five people are accusing German Bishop Walter Mixa of hitting them repeatedly while they were residents at a Catholic children's home in the 1970s and 1980s. A diocesan spokesman says the allegations are absurd, untrue, and obviously invented to defame the bishop. In other international news, Pope Benedict says two deadly bombings in Moscow on Monday were brutal acts of violence and should be responded, with a, responded to with a firm will to stop terrorists and those who back them up. In a telegram to Russian President Dmitry Medvedev, the pontiff also expressed his sentiments of solidarity, spiritual closeness, and condolences to the victims' relatives. Monday's subway bombings in the Russian capital city killed 39 people and left more than 70 injured. Africa's most populated country, Nigeria, is becoming a focal point for the Catholic Church. It is a country that's seen tensions flare recently between Muslims and Christians. But as Christian Purefoy reports, that is not at all halting the church's expansion. Catholicism on the march. This small celebration of Palm Sunday on the outskirts of Lagos City in Nigeria is a demonstration of a huge congregational shift. With Africa now the fastest growing region in the world for the Catholic Church. I'm very fascinated with the number of people I saw today coming out. It's growing and if you check we need even to expand the church. It's really growing. Missionaries first came to Nigeria in 1865. Now an estimated 15% of the population, or 20 million Nigerians, are Catholics. After all, Nigeria is Africa's most populous country, and a vast majority of the people here live in poverty. Taking his own family to the local Catholic church, Michael Haose explains how the church fills more than just a spiritual role. I can't afford a better place to live and struggle to send my children to school, he says. But the church helps people who don't have work. It's not all positive, though. Pope Benedict XVI has been criticized after reaffirming the Catholic ban on condom use during his first trip to Africa last year. Africa accounted for 75 percent of AIDS deaths in 2007, according to the UN. Most public health officials believe the spread of the disease can be prevented through condom use. Because in other settings, other churches, you preach this. We still talk about condom, but I know in the Catholic setting, that is where I grew up, they don't really like it. So I, it's a real problem for us that are working in the NGO world. But the church stands by its role in the community. When they come out to, to meet other people, they discover that I'm facing challenges, they're facing challenges, but we can come together. With their ranks swelling, Africa's Catholics may not be the Vatican's most traditional congregation, but they are now one of its most important. And that is Christian Purefoy reporting. Well, as the rebuilding continues in earthquake-ravaged Haiti, there is news that the country's only major Catholic seminary will reopen on Tuesday. 30 waterproof and wind-resistant tents will be used as classrooms and dormitories for seminarians there. 14 Haitian seminarians died in the January earthquake. The collection at the Pope's Holy Thursday Mass in Rome will go to benefit the seminary. And finally, St. Patrick's Day may have been a couple of weeks ago, but the celebration did not end in Brooklyn. New York City's final St. Patrick's Day parade of the year happened this past Sunday. Our cameras were there in Bay Ridge to catch all of the action. Isn't it a little bit late for uh, to celebrate St. Patrick's? We're Irish, we get the whole month. <laughs> And we're all here to celebrate Brooklyn, to celebrate uh, the uh, Bay Ridge, 
and um, where we live. This is our home. We do this every year, the fourth Sunday of March of every year. We get the best bands, the best marching groups. We're the only parade marching today. And we're the only parade that goes from church to church. St. Patrick's brought the faith to the people of Ireland, and the people of Ireland brought the faith to this country, and they built our churches, they built our, uh, uh, this great nation with all of their traditions and all of the heritage that they brought to this country. Uh, the parade starts in the morning at a mass at St. Patrick's Parish on 4th Avenue, and the, the parade route goes from St. Patrick's Parish to Our Lady of Perpetual Help. So all the parishes have uh, participants in it, and it's a great parade. Because the neighborhood parade, it's a family parade. We're all together here. We, we want everybody to come out as a family. Everybody gets together like one family. And I think it's fantastic. This has been going on for years. And I'm in Bay Ridge since 1979. And each year I enjoy every minute of it. This parade is uh, more special in Manhattan because it's local. We see uh, friends we usually only see only once a year. And it's uh, usually a good day. There were your Irish step fun. dancers. I know, there they were. I was looking for them at the Manhattan Parade right. the, the other week. But, you know, anyone Irish step dancing, I'm sure, especially anyone there and anyone in that video, much better at it than I am. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, they know what they're doing. They've been practicing a long time. Yeah. I love how this parade celebrates the local community in Bay Ridge, but it also is so inclusive as Brooklyn is with its diversity. I yeah. mean, anyone, whether they're, you know, Jewish, whether they're, uh, you know, Arab, whatever it is, everybody yeah. comes together to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Really cool. Everybody in the green. I, I mean, love it. Yes. Really cool. <laughs> we'll stay tuned. There's more currents coming up. Coming up, a currents exclusive. Did the New York Times get it wrong? The man at the center of this controversial report speaks out. Welcome back. As you heard at the top of the show, Bishop DiMarzio last night was sharply critical of the New York Times for its reporting in the case of Father Lawrence Murphy. He's a Wisconsin priest. He was a Wisconsin priest who was accused of sexually abusing up to 200 deaf students decades ago. The Times attempted to draw a connection between Father Murphy and then Cardinal Ratzinger, who is now Pope Benedict. This week, the priest who oversaw the case against Father Murphy wrote a newspaper column criticizing the Times. And among other things, he noted that the paper has never contacted him during its reporting and that it got a number of key facts wrong. And that priest, Father Thomas Brundage, is now joining us from Alaska. Hey, Father, how are you? Hey, good morning. Doing fine. Thanks for taking some time out uh, to join us here on Currents. We really appreciate your time. Now, you uh, uh, were at one point the judicial vicar for the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, and that's you're doing that, that same job, but now for the Archdiocese of Anchorage, correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. Well, very good. Now, start off here by, uh, I know that, that this article uh, that, that you have written is, is also, much like our uh, bishop, uh, has, has made known very critical of the Times, of the New York Times and their reporting, and the reporting of other media outlets in this story as well. Give us, if you will, kind of just the background, uh, maybe the Reader's Digest version, I guess, of the background of this case okay. involving Father Murphy. Okay. Uh, you know, the first of all, um, you know, he was assigned to St. John's School for the Deaf uh, uh, between uh, 1950s and uh, basically through the 60s and part of the 70s. And um, uh, during that time, there were really some horrific crimes committed against children, and, you know, police were contacted. However, because of statute of limitations issues, they were not able to pursue a case against him. I was not involved in the case until 1996, where a group of a, a couple of former students, and especially their wives, uh, insisted upon seeing myself and other archdiocesan authorities, and they laid out kind of the gruesome details of what had happened to these uh, to these men or, or boys at that point um, decades ago. Uh, we spoke with the Archbishop of Milwaukee at that time, Reverend Weekland, and we initiated a criminal case against uh, Father Murphy with two uh, accusations. The first one was the sexual abuse of minors. The second one was um, solicitation in the confessional, both of which are obviously uh, high-powered and horrendous crimes, especially committed by a priest. 
And so uh, from 1996 to 1998, for approximately 18 months, we worked hard on this case, uh, doing everything we could um, to bring justice uh, against Father Murphy and for uh, the members of the deaf community who were affected by this. We ran into some problems with regards to canon law. The first one was we had three different procedures that we had to follow. Right. Um, and you know, our first problem was the statute of limitations at that time or solicitation was 30 days. Sure. Uh, the crimes have been committed 25 years ago. Obviously, yeah. that's a major problem. A L- little bit of a problem there, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, we, uh, so we, we contacted the Congregation for Doctrine of the Faith, which had competency at that time, and then they waived uh, in our favor the uh, statute of limitations. So we proceeded with the case. We uh, had interviews with about a dozen of the victims, and uh, we were getting ready to uh, depose Father Murphy himself, and he, he refused to come to Milwaukee. And about a week later, he died. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the pieces of misinformation in the New York Times, or at least the impression you get from the mainstream media, is that the case was withdrawn. There were only two people legally and canonically who could have withdrawn the case. One was Archbishop Weekland. I know factually he did not do that. Right. The other person was myself, right. and I never did that. Gotcha. So the important message is, on the day that Father Murphy had his, had his last breath, he was still on trial. And gotcha. uh, my, my biggest regret in this case was we were not able to complete it. And so you know, justice in this matter is, is in God's hands. Yeah, there you go. And, I'm, and, yeah, and a lot of questions uh, were left there kind of, kind of out in the open because he did pass during the, the uh, you know, procedures uh, that were ongoing. Mm-hmm. You've outlined in your article, uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, as you just alluded to, uh, what you call sloppy reporting mm-hmm. and inaccurate reporting by the Times and by a lot of other media outlets. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are some other uh, things that the media has just gotten wrong on this story? Well, I mean, I, first of all, I, I, the part of the sloppiness was um, I am contactable in, here in Alaska. Uh, we have phones and faxes and email. <laughs> in fact, we're the most uh, connected state per capita with regards to the Internet. I think that the New York Times, before publishing my name with comments, uh, as well as the Associated Press, had a, a professional obligation to at least check with me. And, you know, I heard on a radio station in Anchorage last week, uh, St. John's School for the Deaf, I immediately knew what the issue was going to be. Right. And um, so uh, I found on the Internet the documents that the New York Times were quoting me from, and it wasn't my writing. It may have been things that I said, but um, I had not written those things. It was, I have terrible handwriting. This handwriting was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was the first problem. The second problem I had is... Um, they, along with other media groups, are trying to make a connection between uh, Pope or Cardinal Ratzinger then, right. and Pope Benedict now, and the Father Murphy case. I was um, as connected to the case as basically anyone. I would have been in a position to have known if Cardinal Ratzinger had been involved in this case. Uh, in fact, I met him in 2001, and uh, had I known that he had been involved in this case, I certainly would have had a discussion with him about mm-hmm. it. And, um, you know, I've challenged the mainstream press in the interviews I've done. I've not seen to this moment any kind of factual connection. Yeah. And the analogy I would use is, let's say that Thomas Brunch, a citizen of the United States, were to write to an official in the president's administration, let's say the secretary of state. Mm-hmm. Do I really believe that the secretary of state is going to read my letter and uh, respond personally? Um, you know, the church is a community of about 1.2 billion people. Right. The fact is, is when something goes horrifically wrong in the church, um, the Congregation for Doctrine of the Faith is what who receives it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so he had he had a large staff to deal with it, and um, and I just think it's absolutely absurd to try to uh, paint um, uh, Pope Benedict as somehow or another doing an injustice in this case. If anything, the Congregation for Doctrine and the Faith, as well as the Supreme Court of the Church, they were extremely helpful throughout the process. Okay. All right. Well, Father Thomas Brundage, thank you so much. That's all the time we have uh, okay. for this, this time around. But I thank you so much for taking some time out of your, I know, very busy schedule here okay. the past couple of days to talk to us. We really appreciate it. Oh, so. I keep on trying to remind myself it's Holy Week. So. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we can all use a reminder of that. That's right. Okay. Thank you so much. God bless. Yep. Bye-bye. Thank you.
and I'll have more on this uh, in our blog over on our website. It's going to have there also a link to Father Brundage's column. Just visit CurrentsNY.net, click on Riding the Wave. Stay tuned, we'll have more Currents straight ahead. When we return, clearing your conscience and your soul as we head toward the Easter celebration. It's a wonderful time given to us by the church and by Christ to really reconnect with this awesome God of love. Well, finally tonight, if you pass by your neighborhood church on Monday night, you just may have noticed more activity than usual. It was Reconciliation Monday. Indeed it was. It was a special event involving all the churches in two dioceses, the Diocese of Brooklyn and the Diocese of Rockville Center. And I headed out to one parish right here in Windsor Terrace to check it out. On a rainy Monday during Holy Week, parishioners gathered in churches throughout Brooklyn and Queens, along with Nassau and Suffolk counties, for the Sacrament of Penance. It's an opportunity for penance before Easter, which is very important. All of Long Island today, for at least six hours, there's an opportunity for confession. Sometimes there will be a special service within it. But at least the people know that if they go to the church, there will be a priest to hear their confessions. Every church in the Brooklyn and Rockville Center diocese was open for a special six-hour period Monday for priests to hear confession. At Holy Name Church in Windsor Terrace, Brooklyn Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio was on hand to celebrate the Sacrament of Penance. It's one of the sacraments that uh, you really do feel the presence of God when you're administering it. You do feel the Holy Spirit guiding you to help a person confess their sins and to start their life over again. Monday was the second day of Holy Week, the culmination of the season of Lent. Catholics observe Lent as a time of preparation for Easter and the celebration of the resurrection of Christ. But before the celebration comes examination. Lent is this wonderful time given to us by the Church and by Christ to really reconnect with this awesome God of love, to really speak and hear ourselves kind of say to things we, we, we want to get off our chest and, and out into the open, those sins, those things we regret, so we can feel that connection. Now, as you can see, it may not have been the most beautiful of days here in Brooklyn, but it was a very important one for people here in the Brooklyn Diocese. Now, the rain may have kept some people away, but others told me they weren't going to let a little dreary weather keep them from coming out for this day of reflection, preparation, and penance. I didn't count how few. I was grateful for the ones that came. Um, so, yeah, you know, maybe the weather's playing a factor. You come whether it's raining or shining, but, yeah. Not as crowded as I thought it would be. Maybe everybody's holier than I am. I don't know. <laughs> I just like to, it's, it's nice to have a conversation with the priest and just to feel, I guess, rest assured that you're doing the right thing, trying to be a good Christian. And I think it's important for everyone who, who knows Christ to acknowledge him, to honor him, and to reconcile to him. And uh, what better time than Easter? No matter the reason they came for Reconciliation Monday, one thing is for sure, everyone here is looking forward to that day of celebration on Easter Sunday. The grace of Easter is a great uh, grace, a great opportunity to become closer to God. And the, the more we're detached from sin and from our faults, the better chance we have of receiving a better grace at Easter. So that's why it's great, a great time to do this. From the cross, we move to new life and resurrection. And so these days are so holy, so awesome, because they move us right through the very essence of what it means to be a Catholic Christian, celebrating Christ and who Christ is, and then who Christ calls us to be in this world, light, hope, love, and mercy. Great reminder there for this Holy Week that, you know, there is a purpose to it all. There's a purpose to looking forward to Easter and to that, that preparation is a, really a time of reflection there. So I think, uh, yeah, Reconciliation Monday, uh, you know, got a thumbs up from a lot of people there. Yeah, and light, hope, love, and mercy, and also light, not just in the shining light of God's love, but also in the fact that you can, in this kind of an instance, feel a bit lighter in your own self, right. have less of a heavy heart if you're able to unload some of those burdens that you may be feeling and share them and really give them over. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And even, you know, on a, on a rainy day as it was, yeah. people still came out. It might not have been the numbers that would have said if it had been sunny and 70 degrees, 
<laughs> but, uh, you know, <laughs> it will we're looking happen. forward to that. The weather's just been too bad here recently. Oh, yeah. But no, I mean, it, you know, it might have been uh, larger crowds there, but the people who were there, I think, were really, you know, very focused on that, on that reflection. And as you heard there, the woman say, you know, maybe everybody else is holier than I am. Right. They didn't have to come. Yeah. But I don't think that necessarily I, I, be the I, case. Yeah, but I don't think so. I think she was good to go, but I think that there are probably a few more of us out there that might have made the trip as well. <laughs> right, right. I don't know. But it was all good. But anyway, yeah, it was. and we also wanted to mention this about today's show as well. We uh, had to schedule an, an interview. We, had, we actually had to reschedule an interview with uh, a unique event. It was actually taking place on Friday, this mm -hmm. coming Friday. You did the interview, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. It's called Subway Stations of the Cross, this event. And because of our interview with Father Brundage, which happened earlier on in the show, we were unable to air the interview about Subway Stations of the Cross. But there is good news for you. You can find it online. CurrentsNY.net is our website. and It'll be posted right there. And while we will be off the rest of the week for special coverage of Holy Thursday and Good Friday, you can visit that link to keep up with us anytime. You can also always follow us on Twitter. You can become our fan on Facebook as well. Until next time, I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great night and a great Easter.